Well, welcome to Ransom Church. We're excited that you're with us. Uh, I want to just across all campuses today welcome our newest campus. As we mentioned, Rock Rapids campus launches today. Uh, and we, yeah. And, uh, we're so excited. We're so proud of this group from Ransom and from Rock Rapids in that area whose heart was breaking for that community and who chose to do something about it. You guys are an inspiration to us. Welcome to the Ransom family. Uh, so today we are starting a new series called True-ish. Uh, we did a series originally back in 2009 this year as we celebrate our 10-year anniversary. Uh, we've been going through those the top 10 series in Ransom history. And as we jump into the series, we're going to start with the game. Uh, we're going to play true, or, yeah, we're going to play true or false. Uh, and I want you to, I'm going to put some, we're going to put some statements up on the screen here. I want you to tell your neighbor, do you think these statements are true or do you think they are false? So statement number one. The Bible is the most shoplifted book in the world. True or false? Tell your neighbor what you think. All right, that statement is absolutely true. Now, that is due in large part to the Gideons and all the Bibles they leave in hotels, hoping that they get stolen. So it is the most shoplifted book in the world. Number two, a kiss lasting one minute burns 100 calories. True or false? I see the hope on some of your faces. Some of you are thinking, <laughs> glory to God, this has to be true. Uh, this is actually not true. It is false. Although if you are married, if you do kissing well, it can lead to things that might burn 100 calories. Amen. Okay. Number three, a cat has 32 muscles in each ear. 32 muscles in each ear. Tell your neighbor, do you think that's true or false? And the answer is... Who cares? It's a cat. So, okay, in this series, we're going to address the issue of truth in our culture. And then we need to address this issue because the reality is truth is up for grabs in our culture. The world has a, a very loose definition of truth. In fact, typically when I want to define a word, I go to the dictionary. A lot of times I'll go to Merriam-Webster's dictionary for definition. And rarely do I find conflict between the definitions in the dictionary and definitions of words in Scripture. Now, Scripture always has the added spiritual element to whatever we're talking about, but rarely do I just find a conflict. But ironically, the word truth is one of those words. Listen to the definition. Truth, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is a statement or idea that is true or, look at this, is accepted as true. You see the problem here? <laughs> This definition of truth seems to imply that truth can change, it can adapt, it can evolve. But what if something is true, but it is not widely accepted? Does that make it false? According to this definition, the answer might be yes. But according to Scripture, what is true is true whether or not it's accepted, whether or not you like it, whether or not it matches with your lifestyle. Truth is truth. So, which is it? Well, that's where we're going today and in this series. So turn with me to John chapter 18, if you will. If you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 650. If you didn't bring a Bible, just raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, please raise your hand. We want to give you one as a gift. Uh, or you can download our app, and all our notes are there as well. On, um, on uh, iPhone or Android, you can get the app. Uh, today we're looking at the story of Jesus and Pontius Pilate. This entire story hinges on the question, what is truth? And the answer to this question is incredibly important because how we answer it will determine how we live our lives, okay? Or let me say that a little differently. What you believe determines how you behave. What you believe determines how you behave. That's true relationally, it's true uh, materially, it's true maritally, it's true financially and morally, and, and uh, ultimately de determines how you live spiritually. What you believe determines how you behave. And not just consciously, but often subconsciously as well. Your beliefs will impact your behavior. Let me illustrate uh, with a story from my life. Tucker is our four-year-old, uh, and uh, he was super, super easy to potty train. Uh, but if you've ever potty trained a child, you know that potty training them on number one is easier than potty training them on number two. And when you're potty training a kid on number two for a while, you got to help them not have tragedies. You know what I mean? Like you got to wipe and you got to do all the things. Cause otherwise, so he would go to the bathroom and when he was done, he'd yell, I'm done. And I would go in there. Well, I started to notice that anytime he'd gone number two, he would have his shirt off when I got in the bathroom. And at first I didn't, 
I didn't think too much about it, but this pattern continued, and finally curiosity took over, and I said, Tucker, why is your shirt off? And he looked at me like I was a complete moron and said, because I pooped. Now, as far as I know, he's never had poop on his shirt. As far as I know, we've never had a a traumatic experience involving his shirt in the bathroom, okay? But for some reason, he's convinced himself, I have to take my shirt off to go number two. Recently, we were in a restaurant. He's now fully potty trained, okay? We were in a restaurant, and, and he said, Dad, I have to poop, as kids will do. And I said, okay, let's go to the bathroom. And he said, can I take my shirt off? And I said, no. And he paused and said, I'll wait. So please understand, like, if you see him running through the lobby of a church with no, sh- no shirt on, he's headed to the bathroom. I don't know why. That's what, because what you believe determines how you behave. You see it? Doesn't matter if it's true or not, our perception of truth will determine our behavior. Christianity is based on God's unchanging truth. That's what should determine our behavior. The problem is most Christians aren't grounded in his truth. In fact, George Barna did a survey of evangelical Christians and asked just some basic, he made basic statements about the Christian faith and then asked, do you agree or disagree? So he made one statement. He made the statement, do you agree or disagree? Satan is not a living being. He's just a symbol. 32% of evangelical Christians strongly agree with that statement. 11% somewhat agree. 5% say, I don't know. So that's half of the church. 48% that, be- that either believe or don't know what they believe about the reality of Satan. That's opposite of what God's Word says, okay? 1 Peter 5.8 tells us that stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring, a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's real, and he's out to get you, okay? Another statement. He said, agree or disagree? All religions pray to the same God just using different names. 30% of evangelical Christians strongly agree with that. agree, 12% say they don't know. That's 60%, a majority of all believers who either agree with that or don't know if all religions lead to God. But God's truth is very clear on this as well. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So at the onset of this series, the question we got to answer is, what is truth and where does it come from? And the answer is most people just don't know. Okay? So with that as our foundation, let me set the scene a bit here uh, for our story. Jesus is on trial. The Pharisees have trumped up charges against Jesus, and the irony is they're telling lies about Jesus because they don't like the truth that he brought. Okay? They don't like his message. They, they don't want to hear what he's saying. They, they feel convicted by what he's saying, so they're making up their own version of the truth that fits their preferred lifestyle. Does that sound like today at all? And let's pick it up, John 18, verse 29. So Pilate, the governor, went out to the Pharisees, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? Well, we wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. You hear the defensiveness? Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. Jesus replied, is this your own question or did others tell you about me? I love this. Pilate says, are you a king? Jesus says, well, who's asking? You know? Pilate says, how can you, how can you possibly be a king? And if you are a king, what have you done wrong that they're so upset? Why are these people so mad at you? Jesus answered in verse 36. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to Jewish leaders, but my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate goes on to say, so you're you're a king then. And Jesus says to him, essentially, you're missing the point. Pilate, you're missing the point completely. Look at verse 37. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And Jesus says, Pilate, you're missing the point. Here's the point. You say I'm a king, and you think that's why I'm here. You think as a king, I did something wrong. You think the reason I'm standing before you is be- and I'm on trial is because I'm a king and they're upset. That's not why I'm here. The reason I'm before you, the reason I'm trial is they don't like what I said. They don't like my truth. 
They don't like why I came. You see, Jesus came to tell us the truth. And that's not what they wanted. They wanted political freedom. They, they wanted to be liberated from their current situation. And Jesus instead comes telling the truth, the truth about himself, the truth about a God, God the Father who loves us deeply, the truth about our sin, the truth about our desperate need for a Savior. He came to share his unchanging truth with, it, with us. And some of it we embrace openly. But some of it it's harder to hear because we don't like the implications. Jesus says, I came to tell the truth. That's why they're upset. And he says, all who love the truth recognize what I say. Some translations put it this way. Those on the side of truth. So let me, let me make a hard statement here. There are sides. There, there are absolutes. In a world that tells you there are no, are no absolutes, I'm telling you, there's right and wrong. There's black and white. There's good and evil. There is a choice between truth and lies. And none of that's affected by whether or not we choose to believe it. Well, Pilate responds with the world's response. Verse 38, he says, what is truth? And really what he's asking is, is there really one truth? I mean, how could there possibly really be just one truth? We don't want there to be one truth. We consider it narrow-minded because, listen, if there's truth, we don't, we don't want it to be black and white. If, if there's truth, there's too many implications. Like if something is true, that means other things are false. That means I have to follow the truth, whether I like it or not. If something is right, it means I might be wrong. It means the people that I love might be wrong. It means that the way that I feel, no matter how real it feels, might be wrong. It means the lifestyle choices I'm making might be wrong, if there is such a thing as right and wrong. And I'm telling you, that's a hard pill for, even for me to swallow. And to top it all off, we have an enemy who's working against us. The devil is the father of lies. In John 8, we read, He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He is the father of lies. In other words, Satan is king of the true-ish. And often he won't come out and say something completely out in left field. He'll give you something that looks and feels true, but at its very core is based on a lie. And bit by bit, you will justify. And bit by bit, he will mislead you with the true-ish until you wake up one day and you're far from God and you're far from the truth and you're not sure how you got there. I think that's where our culture is today. You hear statements in our culture all the time. Truth is whatever you choose to believe. There is no absolute truth. People who believe in absolutes are dangerous. And that's what we're going to talk about in the coming weeks. This is one of the greatest problems our generation is facing. Satan has two great weapons pointed at the church, and he's using them every day. Weapon number one is relativism. It's the assumption that there's no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is completely relative, okay? This is the Merriam-Webster de definition of truth, the idea that truth is evolving, uh, that what used to be true in the past may not be true anymore. A 19th century German philosopher named Hegel had a theory known as the Hegelian dialectic. And in this theory, he basically said, whenever you have a truth and that truth collides with an opposing view, in that moment, a synthesis occurs that creates a new truth. And we see this played out in our culture. Let me give you an example. The 1950s, marriage was a sacred institution. That, was, that truth came from the pages of Scripture. Mar marriage was holy, and it was treated as holy, okay? Now, that doesn't mean every marriage in the 1950s was good or anything like that, but the sanctity of marriage was seen as a, a value by everyone in culture. The 1960s came along, and we had a sexual revolution where people started saying, who cares about marriage? You just do what feels good to you. And, and what, what this Hegelian dialectic says is they crashed into each other, and the colliding created a new truth that we're living by today, which says marriage doesn't really matter. You can live together before you're married. You can sleep together whenever you're dating. It doesn't really matter. That's the way society's living. And society would say that this moment created, the sexual revolution created a new truth. The problem is it didn't create a new truth. It just bent God's truth. God's truth is unchanging. It created an idea that was true-ish. Are we tracking? Now, is any of that happening in our culture today? I mean, you better believe it, right? And this has allowed Satan to wield weapon number two. Weapon number two is something called subjectivism. 
Subjectivism says, I, the subject, have the right to determine what is right and wrong without submitting my judgment to any authority outside myself. I decide what's right and wrong for me. There's no absolute standard of truth, so you cannot impose your beliefs on me. I am the source of truth for me. So I will determine what is right and wrong in my actions based solely on how I feel on the inside. If it feels right, if it feels good, it must be right and good. As long as it makes me happy, that's all that matters. As long as I'm sincere, it, do, it doesn't matter what I believe. As long as I'm not hurting anyone, that's okay. I mean, every one of those statements sounds true and is true-ish. And that's where we're going in the coming weeks. But they sound so good, it feels so right. But when I believe those false beliefs, what you believe determines how you behave. And that's the picture of our culture and our world today. If I say something is true, I'm labeled as intolerant. And at very least, I'm seen as arrogant, and at worst, I'm seen as dangerous, which puts me in a super awkward situation as someone who preaches God's unchanging truth. Like, I'm claiming to stand up here and preach an unchanging truth in a world that does not believe in it. So do me a favor. Show me some grace in the next few moments here. Assume with me for the moment that there is such a thing as absolute truth, that there's such a thing as right and wrong, okay? In fact, every one of us lives as if this is true. Let me give you some examples. Every time you breathe... It's based on the absolute truth that there's oxygen and you need it to survive, okay? When I burn my hand on a stove, and then later you come along and you reach for the same hot burner, and I say, no, don't. It's not because I'm arrogant. It's not because I'm dangerous. It's because I experience the power of an absolute and life-changing truth, and I'm trying to keep you from experiencing the same pain that I experience. When you don't randomly walk into your neighbor's house, and they don't randomly walk into your house, that's based on what you perceive as right and wrong. And the very idea of right and wrong is based on the fact that there must somewhere be an absolute truth. But when there are no absolutes, there's no right and wrong. Which means I can steal from you, I can lie to you, I can take advantage of you, I can even kill you. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. Because it's not wrong in my mind. It feels right to me. Okay? Now that's ridiculous. So let's just assume for a minute that there are absolutes. And what we're saying as Christians is those absolutes come from God's unchanging truth. So what does his truth, what does the Bible have to say about truth? Well, first, it tells us that truth is not just a what, but a who. It's not just a philosophy or a mindset or a statement you learn from a book, something you memorize. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. Amen? John 14, 6 tells us, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Truth is not a thing. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. God's kingdom is a relational kingdom, and God is a God of love, and he loves you, and he desires a relationship with you. He loves you so much, he sent his son full of grace and truth. John 1, 14 describes Jesus this way. So the word, that's Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. In other words, he was full of truth. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus is the truth, and yet so many people reject that truth. And it's important to know why they reject that truth. It's not because of how Jesus lived on earth, okay? When you look at Jesus' life, the way that he lived, it was a beautiful life. And even people that hate Christians and hate Christianity tend to be really cool with Jesus. Isn't that interesting to you? They tend to be fine with him. In fact, Dan Kimball years ago wrote a book called They Like Jesus But Not the Church. And he shares the opinions. These are opinions of unbelievers about Jesus. Alicia, a 24-year-old biologist, said, Jesus to me is an all-loving, perfect, prophetic person. Dugan, 30-year-old coffee shop manager, said, Jesus was a voice of peace, and hope and inspiration to many people. Erica, a 23-year-old grad student, said, Jesus is someone I really respect. His teachings hit you at a very personal level. Penny, a 35-year-old ad manager, said, Jesus was someone who lived out his message and wasn't a hypocrite like many modern religious leaders. And as you interviewed these people in the book, they didn't have as nice of things to say about Christians. 
Here's the realization culturally, okay? People reject faith not because of Jesus, but because of how Christians represent Jesus. There's a, a priest out there named Alfred Loisy who put it this way. He said, Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom, and what arrived instead was the church. Ouch. In other words, as a whole, the church has set a, a poor example. People come looking for Jesus, and they find us. That's got to be a trip, right? That's got to be a shocker. I read the gospel, and then I met Christians. And many people have rejected Jesus because of an experience of all truth but no grace. They've been hurt by legalism. They've been hurt by judgmentalism and, and by the attitude that, listen, if you don't, if you don't start to you know, live and act and look and dress and smell like us, you're probably going to hell. The church is full of that. And it's hard to find the love of Jesus in all of that. The problem is the world responds with grace but no truth. The world responds with relativism and subjectivism and whatever works for you and as long as it makes you happy, you just make up your own truth. And hanging on a cross between those two extremes of legalism and license, Jesus came full of grace and truth. Both. My desire, our desire in this series is that you would experience him. That you would experience the truth, the unchanging, absolute truth of scripture. And that you would experience grace and forgiveness for your sins. Because when you experience the unchanging truth of Scripture and grace at the same time, it is life-changing. The problem is I can't explain it to you. You have to experience it. You, have to, you can't take my word for it. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to learn about Him. You've got to pray. You gotta, if you're a skeptic, open up this book. Not this one. Open up your copy of this book. Open up your mind and your heart and read about Jesus. And ask yourself, could he, forget what I've experienced, forget what I think I know about Christianity, could Jesus be the truth? And if you come to the conclusion, he is the way, the truth, and the life, then the second thing will happen as well. The truth can set you free. The truth can set you free. John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then in verse 36, so if the Son, if Jesus, the truth, if he sets you free, you are truly free. Now, if you've attended Ransom for a while, you should know our vision. I want you to, what's our vision? Yell it out to me. Setting yeah, setting captives free. We want to see people learn what it means to worship God free of inhibition. To learn to follow the truth and live more and more free of sin and to serve free of self. And we're going we're gonna to do a whole sermon series on that after the first of the year. But we do those things with one result in mind. That you would be set free to be who God made you to be. Free from the true-ish and set free by the truth of Jesus Christ. Because that's why he came. He came to testify to the truth. So in a series where we're exploring truth, let's start off with just a short list of some truths that we know because of what we can read. Here is the truth. There is a God. He does love you. He wants to save you. You have to make the choice. There is a right, there is a wrong. You are responsible for your choices. It's not about you at all. What you believe determines how you behave. So how have false beliefs affected your life? Or maybe more significantly, how have true-ish beliefs affected your life? St. Augustine said this, When regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things will remain doubtful. And we recognize that there's probably a whole lot of people in this room today at the start of this series on truth sitting here full of doubts. And right now the truth is in front of you, but maybe you're just struggling to accept it for what it is. More than anything, we want you to be able to find Jesus. We want you to be able to find the truth and to let that truth set you free. But there's nothing that we can do up here or say up here that can convince you. I can tell you the truth. I can tell you what, what I've experienced. The only way for you to truly accept that is to take a step of faith. Jesus can set you free. Free from chasing this world. Free from hurts or habits or hang-ups. Free from pain of trying to find meaning in a world that's offering none. 
free from loneliness and fear and shame and sin. None of us can make a decision for you. All we can do is tell you our story. I can tell you what he did for me. Tell him how I and tell you how I encountered him, how I encountered truth and how it's changed my life. So this morning, if you're starting off this series racked with doubt, I want to encourage you to do something. To grab your hand out and circle the cross in the upper right hand corner or open your Ransom Church app and tap on the cross icon so that I can call you this week and tell you my story and tell you how I encountered truth and how truth set me free. And maybe it's something that can happen for you as well. So while you're doing that, if that's you this morning, we're going we're gonna to start off this series with prayer. We ended the last series with prayer, and we want to start off this series with a prayer. So I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray specifically as we seek truth. Heavenly Father, I want to pray today for all those here who are sincerely trying to find an answer to the question, what is truth? And God, I'm praying that today, throughout this series, wherever it may be, that they would find you and that that encounter would set them free. Lord, I pray it would be life-changing. God, for all of us, I pray that we would be able to see the lie of relativism and see the lie of subjectivism for what they are. And God, I confess that in my own life, there's a tremendous need to be cleansed from lies that have tried to keep me from you. Lies that we believe as a society, lies that feel right, but that are leading us to a dead end and ultimately to death. God, we are here this morning to set aside those lies. God, show us the truth. Show us your son. And Jesus, I put my trust in you because you are the truth. And Lord, I admit so much of my life I've been living a lie. So show me more of the truth. God, be the savior of my life and would you guide me daily to your truth Lord I choose to follow you I choose to make your truth the center of my life I pray this in your holy name Amen